everybody. So let's get into round like 16 of trying to get this recorded. All right. So today what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the civil rights movement. Okay. And make sure you guys have everything you need to know to be able to get through this material. All right. So the questions you guys are going to be answering is going to be uh, first, what is civil rights? When did the civil rights movement start and why? What case marked the end of reconstruction? What was adopted to help recreate slavery? What was the importance of Truman's order to integrate the United States military? Um, what was the significance of Brown v. Board of Education 1? Um, what was the day of the modern civil rights movement started? What was the different forms of school segregation? What are some of the effects of the Brown decision? What was the Montgomery bus boycott? What is passive resistance? What was the freedom rise? When did Dr. King write the letter from the Birmingham jail and what was said? Uh, what was the march on Washington? And what was the Civil Rights Act of 1964? What was Selma? Who was Jackie Robinson? And what was the significance of him integrating Major League Baseball? The last question we'll answer is who was Malcolm X? And what was his role in the civil rights movement? So now, as we go through all this material, what I need you guys to do is make sure you guys just be aware and be ready to add on to things as we go through it. So let's go ahead and get started. So first thing you need to do is make sure you guys remember what was Reconstruction. Um, you have a couple of things you want to first talk about what is civil rights. So civil rights refers to those things that the government must do to help provide protection and freedom to form discrimination for all citizens. You also need to make sure you know that traditionally is rooted in the 14th Amendment, which was passed during Reconstruction. Now, ending the servitude ended with 13th Amendment. Uh, remember, that ended all slavery for except for punishment of crime. The 14th Amendment gave all citizens the foreign United States their citizenship. Then the 15th Amendment established the right to vote. You guys deal with me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Early civil rights legislation. So keep this in mind that these, again, take notes as needed because a lot of stuff may not necessarily be in the Cornell notes, these things you need to know, uh, particularly my AP students. The first Civil Rights Act happened in 1865 and also 1875. It aimed, uh, was at the Southern states to make sure that the Southern states can go back and try to reconstitute slavery, but also um, prevented the states from passing laws that will circumvent the amendments that was passed 13, 14, 15 amendments. You also have the civil rights cases of 1883, which invalidated much of civil rights legislation in the civil rights cases, because what happened is that you had uh, white Southerners that came out and said these civil, these civil rights acts actually violated their constitutional rights. So it invalidated a lot of this information. So this is towards the, this was during Reconstruction, also towards the end of Reconstruction. All right, so the court case that actually ended Reconstruction fully was Pleasant v. Ferguson that a lot of historians would argue because they created this separate but equal doctrine. We talked about Pleasant v. Ferguson earlier on. You also now have voting barriers. You have white primary, the grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy taxes, etc. Bodies with old black holes now became Jim Crow laws. And then you have basically extra legal methods of enforcing white supremacy as far as, again, remember the 13th Amendment as far as that um, loophole that slavery was ended except for punishment of a crime. All right, any questions so far? No. Okay. So let's keep talking about this whole idea about extra um, legals on white supremacy. There's a book that was written. There's also a PBS documentary called Slavery by Another Name. Um, I based a lot of my dissertation research on this. So what I want you guys to do is look at this clip real quick and just listen up. Mr. President? I have a brother about 14 years old. A man hired him from me and I heard of him no more. He went and sold him to McGree and they has been working him in prison for 12 months. I asked him to let me have him, but he, he won't let him go. For a period of nearly 80 years between the Civil War and World War II, black Southerners were no longer slaves, Make sure your but they were not you. yet free. In one of the most 
shameful and little-known chapters of American history. Generations of black Southerners were forced to labor against their will. From almost the first moment, white Southerners were responding to try to put African Americans back into a position as close to slavery as they possibly could. The Old South and what was quickly becoming the New South could not proceed without uh, the work of African Americans. But if you had something for free in the past, you don't necessarily want to pay for it now. It was a straight, simple, exploitative system. There was only power, there was only force, there was only brutality. What happened in that period of time was so much more terrible than anything most Americans recognize or understand today. The depth of poverty, the inability of African Americans to access any of the mechanisms of wealth achievement and growth are all rooted in this terroristic kind of regime that, that existed in so many places. Their ability to have what we call the American dream, that is what has been stolen from black folks all through the South. And that legacy has to be understood so that people will be able to speak to it and give our ancestors voice. All right. So that really kind of gets into everything that was going on with slavery by another name, because literally that's what it was more so called. Okay, let's keep going. Any questions about that? All right, so this is an excerpt from my actual dissertation. Um, the loss of slaves after the Civil War left many white American farmers, owners, in peril. Further, black Americans were the experts in cotton production, and the demand for wages from the ex-slaves created an economic disaster for the country. So they needed to reconstitute a way that we can get this uh, labor back done. As you guys have previously been discussed and learned and taught, that this was mainly done through the sharecropping program. All right, so some farmers tried to intimidate black Americans into lifetime contracts, AKA sharecropping. However, the convict leasing system adopted after the end of reconstruction was a lot more successful. And again, that's because remember slavery was abolished except for punishment of a crime. So you guys can do um, more research on that by looking at my dissertation, which is um, on my blog, I've linked to it. Also by looking at this book or going back and watching that um, PBS series. So that's slavery by another name. All right, let's keep going. Now, Pleasant v. Ferguson, don't want to really get too deep into this because we talk about it, but remember, Pleasant v. Ferguson was passed in 1896, which was separate but equal, um, which basically said that um, you literally can have separate facilities. So it's like this right here, a white water fountain, and then a colored or a black water fountain, and that's separate but equal. As long as they have equal access, it's all good. So here's a quick video to help you guys review that. This is the court case that effectively ended Reconstruction. Hi, I'm Yuhuru Williams. I'm a historian. And here's what you need to know in order to sound smart about Plessy versus Ferguson. The Plessy versus Ferguson case originated with Louisiana's infamous Separate Car Act of 1890. The Separate Car Act required African-Americans and whites to sit in segregated compartments on public carriers in Louisiana. People at the time of the Plessy decision actually believed that it was possible to measure the amount of black blood a person had in their body. The plaintiff in the Plessy case, Homer Adolph Plessy, was actually described as seven-eighths white. Homer Plessy was arrested after he refused to give up his seat in defiance of the Separate Car Act of 1890. Plessy versus Ferguson is considered an important case because it established the doctrine of separate but equal that allowed states for the first time to legally segregate the races. One of the reasons that Homer Plessy brought suit was because of the difficulty in enforcing segregation in states like Louisiana. Louisiana had a large mixed race population, making it very difficult to determine where the line could be drawn in terms of separating the races. The doctrine of separate but equal that grew out of Plessy versus Ferguson 
became the standard for all segregation ordinances after that decision. Despite the Supreme Court's ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the first municipality or city to pass a residential segregation ordinance was Baltimore, Maryland in 1910. The Supreme Court's landmark ruling in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 ultimately was the death knell for the doctrine of separate but equal established in Plessy v. Ferguson. So again, basically now we get into Brown v. Board of Education. This is the start of the modern civil rights movement, okay? So in 1954, um, let me go back. This is a quick video about um, John Green. This is talk about civil rights. You guys can watch this on your own. Um, let's talk about the next question you guys have to do on here. It talks about what is the importance of Truman's orders to integrate the U.S. military. So in 1948, Harry S. Truman issued an executive order to integrate U.S. armed forces to end discrimination in the hiring of the United States government employees. In turn, it's led to civil rights laws enacted in the 1960s. And again, anything that the president passes only has jurisdiction as far as what can be done on only, and I do mean only, only on the uh, federal level. So it doesn't really have a lot of impact on what can be done on the state level. The state's still allowed to decide on what they do and they don't do. Okay. Quick little video, give you guys more detail. Sorry, y'all. And this presentation is on my blog, and I will post it for you guys in Google Classroom with this recording, too. Right, we'll come back to this video later. All right, so let's get into the Brown decision. This is a big one. Okay. So, again, the Brown v. Board of Education case actually effectively ended uh, segregation across the board. So we want to make sure we keep that in mind. And, and in 1896, the Supreme Court ruled that several equal, which was against Supreme Court, uh, was legal in all public facilities. Years later, members of the NAACP, led by Thurgood Marshall, center in the picture right here, this is Thurgood Marshall, um, fought to overturn the ruling. The Brown v. Board of, Edu oh, come back here. The Brown v. Board of Education decision began with a seven-year-old girl named Linda Brown, who was not allowed to attend the elementary school near her home because of her race. Instead, she was forced to attend an all African American school on the other side of town. Brown's family sued the social, excuse me, the school district, but they were unsuccessful. Consequently, Marshall appealed the case, combined it with other smaller, similar cases from around the country, and brought it all the way to the Supreme Court. Marshall argued that separate but equal violated the 14th Amendment because the segregated schools were not totally or actually equal. On May 17th, 1954, which is the newspaper heading, if you know this at the beginning of the Prezi, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that it was unconstitutional to separate schools, se separate schools by race. They ruled in favor of desegregation, public schools in the United States. This decision reversed the court's early decision in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. Okay, here's a quote right here from then Chief Justice Earl Warren. Quote, in these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life. There you go. If he is denied the opportunity of an education, such an opportunity must be made available to all on equal terms. So again, the way that they ended um, several but equal was through the idea of education, because that was one way you can say because you're looking at kids, not necessarily adults. Okay. Now, there are different forms of schools integration. The first form you have is the de facto segregation. This is when you have um, segregation based off of race that occurs because of past social and economic conditions and because of racial, residential racial patterns, based depending on how you live, okay? So if you live on the black side of town, white side of town, we to some degree maybe decide to have that. If everybody lives in some areas, that's, that's what's called de facto. The your um, segregation is when you have racial segregation that occurs because of laws or administrative decisions by public agencies. So instead of you having a choice of where you live, you are segregated because of a certain law. 
But you also have court order book busing. This is when you have kids that might live, let's say, for example, you have no choice in your own, but you have to do this. Let's say all the kids that live in, in Mableton, Georgia, you're forced to then go to school out in Buckhead. Like you have no choice, all those kids go there. And then all the kids from Buckhead get bused into Mableton. Then you also have the resurgence of minority schools where you have bases like just black only schools, maybe you have only Latino only schools, things like that. Those are all different forms of segregation you have, <clears throat> excuse me, integration you have as far as de facto, the jury segregation, court order busings, and resurgence of minority schools. Uh, anybody got any questions? Okay. Everybody good, right? Okay. Let's keep going. All right, so now take a second. I want you guys to look at this graph. This is diversity in public schools. This is fairly old. Our art is not that much different, though. This came out, um, I got this from the Pearson textbook in 2012. This is not from our school textbook. Regular, rather, this is from the um, college um, U.S. government. And you notice here that percentage of students are predominantly minority schools. Most of them are always Black and Latino. Smaller percentage was Asian, American Indian, and very even lower as far as 92%. This percentage is very similar to what we have at our current school at um, in Mableton. So this is more than 50 years of Brown v. Board of Education, right? So I'm going to ask you guys that. Based on that graphic, which form of segregation would you, of integration this would be? Would it be de facto, de jure, court order busing? So which one you guys think this is? Is this more, de, I'm going to give you a heads up. Is this going to be more de facto or more de jure? De facto. De facto. Why de facto. do you guys think it's de facto? De facto. Um, like most blacks and Latinos live over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you think so? You say it's more so it's done because of where people live than anything else, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with you guys. Our particular school would definitely probably be more de facto segregation. Um, you guys know I've been going to a lot of different schools, and it's more so de jure because you racial segregation that occurs because of laws where you have different boundaries. Those laws be like the boundaries of where the schools stop at. Our case would definitely be more so de facto. Okay, let's keep going. All right, go ahead and mute you guys with mics again. All right, so now let's talk about the effects of Brown v. Board of Education and the Little Rock Nine. All right. So although the Brown v. Board of Education decision only applied to, go ahead and put your mic back on mute, to public school systems, many people hoped it would eventually end segregation in other public facilities as well. While the court's decision gave many um, African Americans or Black Americans hope for the future, it angered many white Southerners, making them more determined than ever to preserve segregation. In 1955, the Supreme Court ruled that all public schools in the United States must be integrated are bringing races together as soon as possible. Some schools integrated quickly, but much of the South continued to keep their public schools segregated. Which brings us to 1957, to Central uh, High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, who was ordered to integrate, but the governor of Arkansas, um, Orval Fabius, Fabus, I can never say that guy's name, I'm sorry, opposed integration. He, he was like many other governors in different uh, states. It gives them the idea of federalism, as far as what can the federal government force states to do? So for example, if you look at right now, as far as COVID-19, the federal government can give a suggestion to say, okay, we're gonna close all the schools to May. I'm not saying that Donald Trump and the federal government done that, but I'm saying they can. It's often gonna be up to the states to make that decision. And what you see going on right now, they are maybe giving them suggestions of what to do, but they're not telling them what to do. And they're allowing the states to decide on what's gonna happen. With that being said, I just got a notification on my phone that Kyle County, and all the schools in Georgia will now be going back to at least April 24th due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Just keep that back in your mind. And that was a state decision, not a federal. Uh, so for the first time since the Civil War, a Southern state had gone against the federal government. Since Arkansas had violated the law, um, Fabius removed the National Guard, and Eisenhower sent hundreds of U.S. soldiers to Central High School to protect African-American soldiers as they entered the school. And again, these are the high school students like around your ages. 
These are some of those students who are trying to get to school. Here's a video on them. An event that forever altered the course of race relations in America. Make sure you guys are watching this. Our image notes. reveals itself. The 1957 school year is about to begin. Brown an angry mob is trying to stop nine black students from entering Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas. The question I usually get asked is, were we scared? I think initially, uh, we didn't anticipate clearly all of the violence and turmoil uh, that occurred. The first day that we attempted to go to school, eight of us were at one part of the school and Elizabeth Eckley was at another part. And it was the mob that followed Elizabeth. Then you begin to feel that uh, uh, this was a very hostile, violent uh, group of people. Even at that point, I told myself that if we didn't go through with it, didn't uh, attend Central and backed out, it would just reinforce the view that the African-American community in Little Rock wasn't interested in uh, making a change in things. During the 1950s, African Americans throughout the country were trying to make their voices heard. We, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, Alabama, do now and will continue to carry on our mass protest. The driver, the man that I give this bit of a white man, I didn't feel that I was being treated as a human being. I refused to give up this seat. I said no. Little Rock was a year after the Montgomery bus boycott, so we had seen uh, the impact of, uh, of Rosa Parks and uh, the beginning of Dr. King's career, and uh, knew that things could change. All in favor, let it be known by standing on your feet. The first step for the Little Rock Nine came in May, 1954 when the U.S. Supreme Court issued its opinion in the landmark case, Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education. Separate but equal was inherently unequal, and integration was now the law of the land. In 1957, this decision and the power of the federal government were tested in Little Rock, Arkansas. We didn't, at the moment we were selected, have any idea it was going to be as difficult as it turned out to be. In the face of protests at Central High School, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, calls out the National Guard. His official reasoning is to preserve the peace and prevent violence. Oh, it wasn't clearly wasn't to protect us. It was to make a symbolic stand. It was to protect the way of life uh, in the South because they barred our entrance. <laughs> Hoping to throw open these school doors, President Dwight Eisenhower does the unprecedented. He calls in the 101st Airborne Division of the U.S. Army. I think President Eisenhower wanted to show that the federal government was supreme in this. And they could have done what they needed to do with, with 100 troops. But 1,000 paratroopers was really meant to send a message. Under the guard of the U.S. Army, the students are finally able to do something seemingly very simple, go to school. But it would not be easy for Ernest Green or his eight fellow black students. School was like going to war every day. The walks from class to class were where, you know, you had a lot of harassment, uh, a lot of physical violence. But Ernest Green persevered becoming the first black graduate of Central High School with the class of 1958. Green would eventually go on to a successful banking career and government service in the Carter administration. But in 1958, integration was not complete in Little Rock. The following year, Governor Faubus closed all public schools in Arkansas instead of complying with desegregation. 
Schools in Arkansas would not be fully integrated until 1972. Yet the world would always remember these nine students who, by claiming their place in the classroom, were claiming their place in history. Attending Central was special in the sense that it was part of history. Uh, it was part of a change. This was reverberating all over the country, all over the world. Okay, any questions on the Little Rock Nine and what's going on in Arkansas? Any questions? No. No. We need my name. We need my name. What? All right. So now let's go ahead and talk about Rosa Parks and Montgomery. All right. So a lot of you guys have hopefully heard about Rosa Parks, but she was a seamstress that lived in Montgomery. And basically, she was a group, one of a group of individuals that basically tried to integrate the buses. Uh, and again, we kind of go in a chronological order as far as what were the events that led to everything. Um, Let's move my little talking thing out the way. All right, so she worked for the local chapter of NAACP, and after work on December 1st, she boarded a bus in downtown Montgomery to take her home. She was she found empty seats in the white only section, and again, segregation was still alive and well. She refused to give up her seat and was arrested by the police and fined ten dollars. Parks was arrest sparked the Montgomery bus boycott when African Americans refused to ride the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Although this disrupted their daily routines, African Americans in Montgomery banded together, organizing carpools and shuttles. Uh, to shuttle people from place to place, the boycott hit, hurt the city financially, especially because 75% of all the bus riders were those of Black Americans. The boycott also led to Martin Luther King Jr. and others um, becoming very, very successful. And, thir and after 13 months, the Supreme Court ruled that bus segregation law in Montgomery was unconstitutional. The video gives you guys a little bit more background on the Montgomery Bus Boycott. In Montgomery, Alabama, a people looked at how they were being impacted negatively by their society. And they assumed responsibility for change. Joanne Robinson was an English professor at Alabama State University, and she headed up an organization called the Women's Political Council. Joanne Robinson had an episode on the Montgomery bus where she is accosted by a bus driver. She leaves the bus, you know, in terror. Um, she thought the bus driver was, gonna, was going to hit her as he demanded she sit in the black only section in an almost empty bus. When she talked to other women in the, the Women's Political Council about this episode, she found out that they had similar experiences. There were a number of arrests in 1955 for black women who are violating the segregation ordinance on the buses. And on the night of December 1st, when Rosa Parks was arrested, Joanne Robinson springs into action, and they actually execute this plan to, to initiate a bus boycott. At the time, most people rode the bus to kind of get around. There weren't as many cars in the road. So you begin to realize that if we don't ride the buses, you know, we're able to kind of break the system to a great degree. Joanne Robinson comes on campus late that night with a couple of students, runs off 50,000 flyers. The next morning, between classes, they pass out these flyers. She calls the civil rights attorney, Fred Gray. She calls E.D. Nixon, labor organizer, really the recognized leader of Black Montgomery. And they decide to endorse the boycott. They organize the Montgomery Improvement Association to execute and to coordinate the activities surrounding the Montgomery bus boycott. And they select this newcomer, Martin Luther King, to head up the Montgomery Improvement Association. Martin Luther King weaves into Montgomery ideas about love and civil disobedience, overcoming adversity. And the people of Montgomery were willing not only to listen, but to act on this. I was the NAACP Youth Council president, and I participated in the boycott. I walked to school, and we just saw the empty buses go by because there were no black people on them. We are walking to the same 
At the time that this movement began here, we had about 50,000 African Americans living in Montgomery. And they were pretty close to 50,000 black people who worked together during this bus boycott. We stayed off the buses and found other ways to get to where we needed to go. So they bought station wagons. And they had an actual route, just like buses have routes. For several weeks, I was a volunteer driver every day going out and just hauling people to work or to school. So people just didn't walk. They rode, but they rode in a system that they created. 382 days. Okay, any questions on the McGovern bus boycott? No. no. Okay. Now, mind you guys, um, we were in school. We'd be actually taking a field trip over to the Civil Rights Museum. Obviously, we can't do that. So I'm going. Are you serious? Yeah. That was the field trip that I had planned. Oh. We were supposed to do that actually, if not this week, it's going to be the week after spring break. That's not going to happen, obviously. So I'll make sure I go a lot more in detail because you guys will be able to see some things too. V, I hope you're getting your ride on. <laughs> All right. So let's keep going, guys. All right, so the rise of passive resistance. Okay, so I want to really get into a couple of the organizations. Okay, so this is going to be on my blog too, but I want you guys to really understand this these organization I'm about to talk about. The first organization is going to be the SCLC, which is known as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The other organization will be called SNCC, SNCC, which is for the Southern Non-Body Coordinating Committee. SCLC was typically the elders as far as Martin Luther King's age, 40 and above, give or take. And SNCC was typically high school students and mostly college students, okay? Now, this whole idea about passive resistance really kind of comes out of the um, teachings of Gandhi. Martin Luther King was a Baptist minister from here in the, in the Atlanta area, and he, influenced, he was heavily influenced by the teachings of Gandhi, a leader in India. Gandhi used a method of protest called civil disobedience, which was a refusal to obey laws that he considered to be unjust. In accordance with Gandhi's teaching, King also urged African Americans to use passive resistance to achieve equality. All right. Now, if you look at the two sides of the coin, on the other side, you have Malcolm X. Now, as far as documentation, I've never seen where Malcolm X actually committed a crime once he got released from jail and became a member of the Nation of Islam. However, his was not necessarily passive resistance. So in 1957, Dr. King and 60 other ministers created what we just talked about was the SCLC. The leaders of this group was focused on nonviolent protests. The group taught African Americans how to protect themselves from violent attacks and also how to organize people of nonviolent protests. One of the most famous forms of nonviolent non protests was sit ins. This is when people would sit in in public places and refuse to move until their demands was met. At the Museum of um, African American history here in Atlanta, you actually have a table where you guys can sit down at and you actually gonna have a simulation of sit-ins. This is also one of the things that um, we really like to take you guys out to the field trip to do. Now, the goal of the sit-ins was to desegregate more public facilities. One of the first sit-ins was held at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. Out of the sit-ins came the creation of another civil rights group which was called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Again, these were mostly high school and mostly college students that did this. Although they sometimes disagree on how to approach these uh, protests, both the SCLC and SNCC play key roles in what we now know as the modern civil rights movement. That's a mouthful. Anybody got any questions about that? Any questions? Y'all good? No questions. No. Okay. We're good. Okay. Keep going. All right, so this video is In the wake of the Montgomery victory, Martin Luther King brought together other black ministers and community leaders to form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. With King as its president, the SCLC championed voter registration drives and supported bus boycotts in other parts of the South. At about the same time, President Eisenhower's Attorney General, Herbert Brownell Jr., drafted a proposal for new civil rights legislation. It was universally opposed by Southern legislators. Nevertheless, Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson 
guided a diluted bill to final passage by a 16 to 15 vote, establishing the Civil Rights Act of 1957. The NAACP's Roy Wilkins dismissed it as a crumb from Congress. Even so, it was the first civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. The law provided new authority to the Justice Department to oversee elections and investigate officials who interfered with voter registration. It also created a new division within the Justice Department to prosecute civil rights violations. The legislation was a symbolic victory for King and other civil rights leaders, but not enough to silence their rising demand for full. All right, this gentleman right here, I remember I talked about him earlier in the class. This is Ace of Philip Randolph. So again, he's in the center of everything that's going on. He's not very well talked about, but he's at the center of a lot of things going on in the modern civil rights movement. Of course, over here is um, Martin King Jr. We have some other individuals that we try to talk to about as well. So I'm gonna keep going. You guys can finish watching those videos later on. But I wanna get into the Freedom Rise, okay? Now, the Freedom Rise, um, the whole idea was to really kind of test this whole idea about the end of segregation. So now you have another organization, which was called CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. They decided to test this ruling by in how it was being enforced. So on May 4th, 1961, a group of CORE members known as the Freedom Riders took two buses from Washington, D.C., headed down to New Orleans, Louisiana. The goal was to go through the South and to see was they going to be able to ride together, ride on integrated buses, without being having any issues. Well, the trip proceeded was pretty easy until they got to Alabama. So if you look here, we're living in the um, Great Atlanta area. We live, we, the school's in Mableton, about maybe 20 minutes to Mableton's west is when they started having issues. So in Alabama, angry whites stoned and beat the Freedom Riders and the beatings were captured by television cameras and newspaper writers. Remember, this is a time period where almost everything was on television, almost everything was in the newspaper, it wasn't a lot of, okay, I say for lack of a better word, fluff as far as not being able to see things because TV is still very new. The U.S. Attorney General, who was Robert Kennedy, JFK's brother, if you may recall, asked for the free rides to take a cooling off period in response quickly to say, we have been cooling off for 350 years. We we're not cooling off no more. We'll be in a deep freeze. So the free riders continue to endure violence as they move to Alabama. When, the riders, when they rise to Jackson, Mississippi, they were greeted by police, state troopers, and Mississippi National Guard. When the riders got off the bus and tried to enter the whites only waiting room at the bus station, they were arrested and put into jail. Though many people were injured in the Freedom Rides, the riots continued with their mention and throughout the summer of 1961. So they continued doing that same trip from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. In the fall, the Supreme Court ruling that banned segregation on interstate buses, buses that crossed state lines, and united in, in bus stations was finally in force. So they tested the laws. Here's some of the Freedom Riders. And again, it was an integrated group. And it was, it, you had some SNCC um, members as well as far as these bus rides, but it was mostly made up of core organizers and members. This is a video on the bus ride. The Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, spearheaded the movement's boldest initiative to date. The Freedom Rides, a descent into the deep south. Okay, let me say this first. Um, some of these videos you're about to start seeing may have some graphic material. Um, so be ready. You guys good? Y'all ready for that? Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go. Good. To test compliance with Supreme Court rulings barring segregated interstate travel. Core founder James Farmer acknowledged the perilousness of the journey. I think all of us were prepared for as much violence as could be thrown at us. We were prepared for the possibility of death. On May 4, 1961, two buses departed Washington, D.C., carrying black and white volunteers into forbidden territory. These were the first Freedom Riders. In Atlanta, they parted for the journey through Alabama. When the first bus reached Aniston, it was attacked and firebombed. The Freedom Riders barely escaped alive. The second bus met a similar fate in Birmingham. The city's notorious public safety commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor, made good on his promise to allow Klansmen. Bull Connor is also in the film Selma. They mentioned him. 15 minutes to do their dirty work. Unless 
are part of a group calling themselves the Freedom Riders, an interracial group traveling through the Deep South to challenge some of the segregated bus facilities in this part of the country. Yesterday, they ran into trouble. They ran into violence. Today, they say they intend to keep up their pilgrimage. Mr. Peck, uh, you obviously have been injured. You're wearing bandages. What happened to you? Uh, I uh, got uh, beaten twice yesterday uh, by hoodlums, once aboard the bus and once in the terminal in Birmingham. The attacks left the Freedom Riders wounded, terrified, and trapped among those who had tried to kill them. In Washington, the reaction of President Kennedy and his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, was mixed. They feared for the Freedom Riders' safety, but worried that offering federal protection to the group would inflame the White South. Tell them to call it off, the President demanded of an aide. Stop them. Get your friends off those buses. But it was too late to turn back. SNCC leader Diane Nash recognized this as a watershed moment. If they stop us with violence, the movement is dead. We are coming. Nash sent SNCC volunteers to replace the battle-weary court group in Birmingham. So this is where you see the transition between core members to SNCC. And again, this happened down in Birmingham. Learning of this, the president lost his composure. All hell is going to break loose. She's going to get those people killed. The situation fell to Bobby Kennedy. As head of the Justice Department, he was empowered to intervene if he suspected federal laws were being violated. He dispatched his assistant, John Sagenthaler, to Birmingham to rescue the Freedom Riders. On May 20th, Sagenthaler boarded a Birmingham to Montgomery Greyhound bus along with the SNCC reinforcements. Their arrival in Montgomery was met by a mob of more than 1,000 screaming racists. Some Freedom Riders were able to flee, but others were overwhelmed by fists, iron pipes, axe handles, and baseball bats. John Lewis was beaten and bloodied. Siegenthaler himself was struck in the head with a pipe and kicked unconscious. With no other option, Attorney General Kennedy asserted federal authority by ordering 400 U.S. Marshals to Montgomery to restore order and escort the Freedom Riders to safety. Freedom Riders continued to probe the Deep South through the summer of 1961, inspiring arrests and violence, and forcing the Kennedys to confront the issue head on. Bobby Kennedy began to see the civil rights debate in a new light, not as one issue among the thousands confronting the administration, but as the defining moral issue of the era. As a first step, he petitioned the Interstate Commerce Commission to adopt new regulations that would stiffen already existing federal laws, requiring all interstate transportation facilities to be integrated. But more importantly, the younger Kennedy's attitude influenced the president's evolving position on civil rights. Okay. Any questions on the freedom rights? No. Okay. You guys with me so far? Yes. Okay. It's a lot of material, but it's a lot of material in the civil rights. And I'm trying to make sure I tell you guys some different things other than what you guys already know about. All right, let's keep rolling. Thank you guys for all 15 of you guys still sticking with me. I know it's a lot. You will stay with me, guys. All right. So now let's talk about the Birmingham protests. So now, where's my screen? All right. All right. So Birmingham protests um, protest started in 1963. Um, became a target of Dr. King's uh, desegregation protest. Um, this is where Dr. King. Include Dr. Clean, but SCLC uh, protested, continued to protest pe peacefully. Um, Dr. King spent two weeks in jail, during which he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, when he said, quote, perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the strings, darts of segregation to say, wait. Dr. King defended his passive resistance strategies and encouraged African Americans to keep up the fight for equality. The brutal violence of the Birmingham protests attracted more national attention. 
television stations show pictures, videos, dogs sitting, dogs um, being sent on uh, protesters, and a powerful stream of water from fire hoses. When people across the country saw these images, they were horrified. Not a lot of people understood just how the bad things were. So which forced President, then President Kennedy to send 3,000 troops into the peace, to bring peace into the city. So now JFK is still president during this time period, and now he sends in uh, military to try to bring peace. So although the violence has stopped in Birmingham, it continued everywhere else. On June 11, 1963 is when you have um, NOSAP worker Megger Evers being um, shot and killed outside of his home. Um, on television, it says a great change is at hand. And our task, our obligation is to make the revolution that change peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do, do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right. Shortly after addressing the nation, Kennedy proposed new legislation that was in the form of laws to Congress that he proposed legislation that gave all Americans the right to be served in public places and prevented discrimination in employment. This was going to later be known as the Civil Rights Act of um, 1964. Uh, so this is a video that I'm going to show you guys right now by Megger Evers. Um, he's another well-known civil rights leader. Well, not well-known civil rights leader, but he was huge back in this time period. So for the sake of time, I know this is not going to be very long. I'm going to go ahead and skip this video. Medgar Evers was born in Mississippi. And I'm going to give you guys another, like a near pod later on. But this is going to be. Hi, I'm so Now we're about to go into the 60s um, in a moment. So that John Green video is going to really kind of talk about the 60s, which gives you guys a good synopsis. One thing we're going to be doing on the latter half of class, we'll give you guys some um, crash course video guides to complete. All right, so now let's talk about the Marshall Washington. Okay. So the Marshall Washington happened in um, 1954. And this was huge is when we got really the introduction to Martin Luther King Jr. as far as nationally. Here you guys go right here. And then we'll see this song come true. Yeah, I'm not sure why I'm on video. Wait. And then we'll see this song come true. Okay, the video's not working, so we'll keep going. All right, here's the March on Washington. On August 28, 1963, 250,000 people gathered in the nation's capital for the historic March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The march rallied Americans to stand up against the continuing political and social injustices African Americans still faced 100 years after emancipation. The march took place at a critical moment in the civil rights movement. Tension and racial unrest had been building up throughout the year. With anti-segregation demonstrators making headlines in Alabama and President John F. Kennedy announcing his intention to pass civil rights legislation, the timing was right for a massive demonstration. Due to security concerns, internal marshals were trained to ensure order within the crowd. But as it turned out, the marchers chose peace, not violence, that sunny Wednesday. The event featured speeches from prominent leaders and musical performances by Josephine Baker, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Mahalia Jackson, and many others. The march is probably best remembered for Martin Luther King Jr.'s acclaimed I Have a Dream speech. But we bet you didn't know the real story behind those famous words. King was the last speaker that afternoon, but not because he chose to be. King only spoke last that day because no one else wanted to. When organizers of the march debated who would speak when and for how long, none of the other speakers wanted the last slot because they figured most of the news crews would head out by mid-afternoon. King agreed to go last and to limit his remarks to only four minutes. And he didn't have to worry about not making the news. The audience gladly stuck around for his 16-minute speech. And you might be surprised to learn that King hadn't even intended to talk about his now-famous dream that day. During a pause in his prepared speech, Mahalia Jackson called out from behind the podium, Tell him about the dream, Martin! She was referring to a theme King had touched on in a speech two months earlier in Detroit. 
Honoring her request, King departed from his prepared remarks and delivered the legendary speech we all remember today. Historians believe that the marches and King's speech were important catalysts in passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Today, a memorial marks the spot where Martin Luther King described his dream of a better America in one of the most influential and memorable speeches in American history. Okay, and I made a mistake. I meant to say um, the march happened in 1963, so I apologize for that. All right, so the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, this was done, remember, we talked earlier about what um, John F. Kennedy tried to push through. And that was, was going to be now known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So President Kennedy was assassinated right before it was able to be passed through Congress. So when Lyndon B. Johnson took office, he convinced Congress to pass the bill. The Big L became known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The act banned all segregation in public places, such as restaurants and movie theaters. Segregation was now officially uh, illegal. So now we are fully now done with um, separate but equal, what we saw in Plessy. All right. So now the Voting Rights Act of 1964 gave. So now here's a problem. So now 19. Um, excuse me. The Voting Rights Act of 1965. I'm gonna get to that. The Civil Rights Act covered everything as far as voter registration, public accommodation, public schools, employment. But people still was not able to vote, which is why you had the whole massive demonstration down in Selma. We'll get to that in a second, which led to the Civil Rights Act. Uh, excuse me. The Civil the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You actually had a lot of urban rights that happened after um, these things occurred. You also had the Civil Rights Act of 1968 and other housing re uh, reform legislation. Both the Civil Rights, excuse me, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. As you guys can see, either I am saying them verbally and getting some time confused. So let's look at this timeline to help us out. So voting history. So you have all these different acts that happen. All these different acts, different uh, laws that was passed. We start with the um, 18, you got 1776, suffrage, limit wh white men with property. 1870, you got the uh, 15th Amendment. Then you get to 1915, you got the Gwen, the United States declares the grandfather clause is unconstitutional. 1920, you got the 19th Amendment gives not all women a right to vote. Then you get to 1944, Smith v. All Right ruled that primary, excuse me, that all white primaries is unconstitutional. 1964, you get the 14th Amendment that outlaws poll taxes in federal elections. You also have the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. Then in 1965, in response to events happening in Selma and other areas, um, the Voting Rights Act protects voting rights of, of all racial and ethnic minorities. And then in 1971, you have the 26th Amendment, which lowers the voting age of um, adults to 18 years old. So we literally been fighting with the idea of voting since forever. Okay. Now, increase in voter registration, seven southern states covered by the 1965 Civil Rights Act, which you guys see. This right here is Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. The green is 1965, and then the yellow is 2004. Notice what happened. Particularly look here in Mississippi. Very few were voting. Look what happened shortly after. All right, very famous picture here that's happening at one of the demonstrations. Ice Cube used it in one of his albums. As far as you have an American flag being used to hurt and to hit another American, um, very controversial question, very controversial picture, rather, during this time period. This happened in 1977. All right, this video here Lincoln. is going to talk more about the Voting Rights Act, so I'll let you guys watch that on your own. So let's talk about the Selma right now. Um, if you look at the movie Selma, it really gets into detail about it. But this is when you have in 1965, SNCC's turn its efforts towards voting rights for African Americans. SNCC organized a march in Selma, Alabama, to Montgomery, Alabama, to protest the lack of voting rights of African Americans. As post excuse me, as protests began the march, they had to cross the uh, Pettus Bridge out in out of Selma. As they came to the other end of that bridge, police were waiting for the protesters. They, the police attacked and beat the protesters, forcing them to turn back over the bridge. A few days later, a group left again on the march. This time, President Johnson made sure they were protected, and they marched peacefully all the way to Selma. This attack was known as Bloody Sunday. Several days after the march, President Johnson 
urged Congress to pass a voting rights bill. Months later, on August 1965, the voting rights bill was turned into law with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And again, all this was depicted in the 2014 film Selma. So this is a video to talk about um, Bloody Sunday. With some of the Montgomery marches, the culmination so time, of moving. a long struggle. The majority of Negroes or blacks, as we're going to hear talking about voting the games, too. Yep, to go back and watch this video. One. All right, talk about Jackie Robinson and integration of baseball. All right, quick bio on uh, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play Major League Baseball. Baseball was extremely popular during this time period. It would be like saying the first African American to say go into the NBA or to the NFL. Uh, he joined with the Brooklyn Dodgers. This led to a complete integration of baseball and all other sports. Robinson was a National League's most valuable player in 1949 and the first African American in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Until this time, African Americans played professional baseball, mostly in the Negro Leagues. So, again, as far as segregation, you had the Major League Baseball, which was predominantly all white, and you had the Negro Leagues that was formed where all African Americans were black Americans. And those leagues did very, very well. They were very profitable. You had some of the best players in the league. And what you have is basically Branch Rickey, um, who came in and said, you know, I want to win the World Series. I need some of these better players. So let's talk about we start integrating and get these black players. Jackie Robinson was not the best player in the Negro Leagues. He was seen as being one of the ones that's more capable of dealing with the stress and the attention and things that will come from him as far as being the first one to try to integrate. Uh, it's also depicted in the film 42. This next video is actually a scene from 42 where you have Jackie Robinson really being battered um, with a lot of different racial slurs, throwing balls at his head, things of that nature as well. Hey, boy. Watch, monkey. Hey, nigga, I know you can hear me. You know what you're here for, don't you? Huh? You're here to get the nigga dollars for Ricky at the gate. You don't belong here, nigga. Sit down. Sit down or I sit you down. Problem, You're the problem, you goddamn disgrace. What the hell kind of man are you? You know he can't fight back. Why don't you try picking on someone who can fight back? Well, I'm not gonna fight you. You're thrown out of the game. Stanky now having a chin wag with his ex teammate Chapman. Both men, masters of distraction. Stanky, of course, from second, and Chapman from the dugout. We'll have to wait and see what the umpire does, since he is well within his rights to kick Stanky right out of the game. Hey, Swell! That's enough! Back to the dugout! You shut your mouth, or I shut it for you. This ain't happening. Hey, Stank, what's it like being a nigger's nigger? I don't know, Chapman. What's it like to be a redneck piece of shit? Robinson off. Here's the pitch. <laughs> and Jack comes in short. Not much of a hit to speak of, but Jack is standing on twice. Mr. Pete Pisa steps up into the batter's box. Robinson with another big lead off first. Right today. 
Come on! So that was just some of the things he dealt with. This is a really funny skit. Um, I added this to the presentation. Uh, be mindful, you guys. This presentation is something we normally do over two days. I'm just getting all knocked out now. Definitely go watch this. It's from Saturday Night Live. It's pretty funny. So talk more about Jackie Robinson. Let's not forget about Malcolm X either. Malcolm X was the other side of the coin um, in a sense to whereas um, he was more from the north. Keep in mind, Malcolm X came from very humble beginnings. Um, his father was a preacher who was killed by the KKK. His mother was what we consider to be mulatto, um, mixed breed, if you will. Um, and then also what you had going on is that he actually got into violent crime, things like that. He got sent to jail. And then while he's in jail, he converted up to the Nation of Islam. You can watch the film Michael Max is coming on Netflix um, in April of 2020. I actually might assign that for you guys for some extra points. Um, and these are different uh, scenes from the film, but... He also wanted to have um, black people. He was another civil rights leader. He wanted to have black rights as well, but he came from a different perspective. He wasn't in the South. He was in Harlem, New York. Uh, we talked about Harlem earlier. We talked about the Harlem Renaissance. That whole history is really kind of coming out with him as well. And his idea was if they hit you, you hit them back. So it wasn't nonviolent. So these are two excellent scenes right here from the movie um, Malcolm X. Definitely go back and review this in the presentation. I want to go to this one clip right here. This is a very powerful scene that came from Selma. So let's look at this one real quick. Mrs. King, I mean no disrespect. This is Malcolm talking to Coretta Scott King. I come Coretta with great King, respect for your husband. Who was um, MLK's wife. I have no army behind me anymore. I have myself and the truth. That is all I stand on today. You've said disrespectful things in the past, Minister. So you'll understand why there is some alarm here tonight. I do. I understand that. Your husband and I, we do not see exactly eye to eye on how to achieve progress for the black man. And yes, I have been piercing in my critiques of nonviolence. But because we don't agree, Mrs. King, does not mean that I am the enemy. What do you intend to say to these people then, sir? A lot of work has been done here, and I don't intend to see it undone tonight. Listen up. What he said after that is basically saying... If they don't deal with your husband, they want to deal with me. Who do you think they want to deal with more? And that really gets into the idea of Martin King um, Jr. Where is that he had that Malcolm X who was that opposing um, side of the coin. And not a lot of people want to deal with Malcolm X. All right. So let's kind of wrap it up. So consequences of civil rights legislation. You have more um, African-American participation. You also have more participation by other minorities. We'll get to that um, in the next one in the next video lectures. Um, we also have lingering social and economic disparities, which meaning you still don't have equality across the board. Great film movie right here. Now, do a quiz, you guys. So I hope y'all wake up. It's quiz time. Y'all ready? Cut your videos on. It's quiz time. Want to see y'all? Hope y'all ready for this. Let's see who's been paying attention, all right? And I got my roster here, and I got my pen and paper. Y'all ready? Is everybody ready? Okay. You're not y'all yeah. to expect now, huh? You're going to expect to have a quiz. Yep, we about yeah. to do a quiz. All right. First question. Here you go. If someone is not hired for a job because of their race or gender, it is a violation of their what? A, B, C, or D? D. Raise your hand if you say D. Raise your hand if you say D. B. Raise your hand if you say C. Okay. Raise your hand if you say B. Because I'll answer right there. Okay. Raise your hand if you say A. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the correct answer is B. 
it would be a violation of your civil rights. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. Good job. Okay. Go to the next. We got about three questions. Which Supreme Court case held that states could require separate facilities for African Americans and Anglos as long as the facilities were equal? Was it A, Brown v. Board of Education? Raise your hand, I think it's it. B, plus B, Ferguson? Okay. Um, C, Gildan v. Wainwright? Or D, Sweat v. Painter? Raise your hand if you think it's B again. Raise your hand if you think it's A. Those are your only two options. Raise your hand for B. Raise your hand for B. Let me see your hands. I can't see you, okay? All right. Even if video's not on, I can still see your hands go up. All right. The answer is, guess what? You guys mostly right. B, plus B, Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the question. What court case ended the zero edition of plus B, Ferguson? A. Right. A. Wow. Brown v. Board. Here we go. Wow. All right. Which of the following statements is true regarding consideration of a student's race during a college admissions process? Hmm. A lot of you guys be applying for colleges next year. Let's see what's going on. Which of the following statements is true regarding consideration of a student's race during college's admissions process? I'm going to let you guys read these, and then I'm going to go through the answer to which one it is. Raise your hand for A. Raise your hand for B. Raise your hand for C. Raise your hand for D. Hmm. A. Who says A? Who says B? 